It's Miss Hers. I'm here in my living room coming to you ready to read a book. I know it must be really different to be home right now and I hope everybody is doing well and consider searching out around the house for some materials that you are allowed to use with permission from your parents to make some stuff. Don't forget you can always draw what you see and uh, use those recycled materials to make something fun from your imagination. I'll be posting some information on Twitter and on Schoology for you in the upcoming days. Um, but for now, I'd really like to read you a book. This book is called Amos and Boris by William Steed. Here we go. Amos and Boris. I really, really like the illustrations. Some parts get a little long, so I might paraphrase, okay? Amos, a mouse, lived by the ocean. He loved the ocean. He loved the smell of the sea air. He loved to hear the surf sounds, the bursting breakers, the backwashes with rolling pebbles. He thought a lot about the ocean, and he wondered about the faraway places on the other side of the water. Have you ever thought about places far away, what they might be like? One day, he started building a boat on the beach. He worked on it in the daytime, while at night he studied navigation. Hmm, what does navigation mean? When the boat was finished, he loaded it with cheese. Biscuits, acorns, honey, wheat germ, two barrels of fresh water, a compass, a sextant, a, a telescope, a saw, a hammer, nails, some wood, in case repairs were necessary, a needle and thread for the mending of torn sails, and various other necessities, such as, a, um, such as bandages, an iodine, a yo-yo, and playing cards. What would you bring with you if you were going on a voyage far away? That might be a fun list to draw. On the 6th of September, with a very calm sea, he waited till the high tide had almost reached his boat. Then, using his most savage strength, he just managed to push the boat into the water, climb on board, and set sail. The rodent, for that's what the boat's name was, proved to be very well made and very well suited to the sea. And Amos, after one miserable day of seasickness, proved to be a natural sailor, very well suited to the ship. He was enjoying his trip immensely. Immensely. He was enjoying his trip immensely. What does immensely mean? Means he really was enjoying it, right? Quite a lot. It was a beautiful day. There was beautiful weather. Day and night, he moved up and down, up and down on the waves as big as mountains. And he was full of wonder, full of enterprise, and full of love for life. One night, in a phosphorescent sea, phosphorescent. One night, in a phosphorescent sea, he marveled at the sight of some whales spouting luminous water. And later, lying on the deck of his boat, gazing at the immense starry sky, the tiny mouse Amos, a little speck of a living thing in the vast living universe, felt thoroughly akin to it all. Overwhelmed by the beauty and the mystery of everything, he rolled over and over and right off the deck of his boat into the sea. Whoa. So it sounds like Amos is having a moment in the beauty and he plop fell in the water. Oh gosh, what's going to happen next, I wonder. Help, he squeaked as he grabbed desperately at the rodent. But it evaded his grasp. 
and then he went bowling under, along under the full sail, and he never saw it again. Gosh, you were stranded. What would you do? And there he was, where in the middle of the immense ocean a thousand miles from the nearest shore, with no one else in sight as far as I could see, not even so much as a stick of driftwood to hold on to? Should I try to swim home, he thought? Amos wondered, or should I just try to stay afloat? He might swim a mile, but never a thousand miles. He decided to just keep afloat, treading water, and hoping that something, who knows what, would turn up to save him. But what if a shark, or some big fish, or a horse mackerel turned up? What was he supposed to do to, to protect himself? He didn't know what to do. There he was, floating. Morning. morning came as it always does. He was getting terribly tired. He was very small and cold and wet and worried. There was still nothing in sight but an empty sea. But then, as if it wasn't bad enough, it began to rain. At last, the rain stopped and the noonday sun gave him a bit of cheer and warmth in the vast loneliness. But his strength was giving out. He began to wonder what would it be like to drown? Would it take very long? Would it feel awful? Would there be other mice like me that this has happened to? As he was asking himself dreadful questions, a huge head burst through the surface of the water and loomed up over him. It was a whale. What sort of fish are you? Said the whale. You must be one of a kind. I am not a fish, said Amos. I am a mouse, which is a mammal, the highest form of life. I live on an island. Holy clam and cuttlefish, said the whale. I'm a mammal myself, though I live in the sea. Call me Boris, he added. We are also mammals. So here are two mammals who met each other in a very peculiar situation. Amos introduced himself and told Boris how he came to be there in the middle of the ocean. The whale said he would be happy to take Amy, Amos to the Ivory Coast of Africa, where he happened to be headed anyway, to attend a meeting of whales from all the seven seas. But Amos said he'd had enough adventure to last him a while. He only wanted to get back home and hoped the whale wouldn't mind going out of his way to please take him. Not only would I not mind, said Boris, I would consider it a privilege. What other whale in the world ever had the chance to get to know such a strange little creature as you? Please climb aboard. And Amos got on Boris's back. Are you sure you're a mammal? said Amos. You smell like more of a fish. Then Boris the whale went swimming along with Amos on his back. What a relief to be so safe and secure again, thought Amos. Amos laid down in the sun and began to warm himself. He was being worn into a frazzle. He was soon asleep. Then all of a sudden, he was in the water again. Wide awake, spluttering and splashing around, Boris had forgotten for a moment, oops, that he had a little passenger on his back. When he realized his mistake, he surfaced so quickly that Amos was sent somersaulting, tail over whisker, whiskers, high into the air, hitting the water hurt. Crazy with rage, Amos screamed and, and whacked around at, at Boris until he remembered he owed his life to the whale, and he quietly climbed climbed back on his back. From then on, whenever Boris wanted to sound his, the whales have like a, they go, the water comes out of his back. I think that must have been what happened. So from now on, anytime Boris wanted to go, it's called making a sound. He makes the sound on his back. From then on, whenever Boris wanted to sound, he warmed warned Amos in advance and got 
He's okay. And whenever he sounded, Amos took a swim. <clears throat> Swimming along sometimes at great speed, sometimes slowly and leisurely, sometimes resting and exchanging ideas, sometimes stopping to sleep. It took them a week to reach Amos's home on the shore. During that time, they developed a deep admiration for one another. Boris admired the delicacy, the quivering daintiness, the light touch, and the small, tiny voice, the gem-like radiance of the mouse. Amos admired the bulk, the grandeur, the power, the purpose, the rich voice, and the abounding friendliness of the whale. Have you ever met a friend who is quite different than you? They became the closest possible friends. They told each other all about their lives, their hopes and dreams, their ambitions. They shared their deepest secrets with one another. The whale was very curious about the life on, on land that the mouse had been living and was sorry he could never experience it. He just couldn't. Amos was fascinated by the whale's accounts of what went on deep under the sea. Amos sometimes enjoyed running up and down on the whale's back for exercise when he was hungry. He even ate a little plankton, what the whale was trying to eat. The only thing he missed was fresh, unsalty water. He was thirsty, it sounded like. The time came to say goodbye. They were at the shore. I wish we could be friends forever, said Boris. We will be friends forever, but we can't be together. We must live on land and I must live at the sea, but I'll never forget you. And you can be sure I'll never forget you, said Amos. I will always be grateful to you for saving my life. And I want you to remember that if you ever need my help, I'd be more than glad to give it. How could he ever help Boris though? He was so much bigger than him. He didn't know, but he knew. He didn't know how but he was willing to, to figure it out. The whale couldn't take Amos all the way into the land because it was too big. They said their goodbyes and Amos dived off Boris's back and swam towards the sand. I really love these illustrations. See how simple they are? From the top of a cliff, he watched Boris's spout twice. Pew, pew and disappear. Boris laughed to himself, how could that little mouse ever help me? Little as he is, oh, that's cute. He's all heart. I love him and I'll miss him terribly, he thought. Boris went to the conference off to the ivory coast of Africa and then went back to a life of wailing about while Amos returned to his life of mousing around and they were both happy. But the story didn't end there. Many years after the incidents just described, Amos was no longer a very young mouse. And when Boris was no longer a very young whale, there occurred one of the worst storms of the century, Hurricane Yetta. And it just so happened that Boris, the whale, was flung ashore by a tidal wave stranded on the very shore where Amos happened to make his home. It also just happened that when the storm had cleared up and Boris was lying high and dry on the sand, losing his moisture in the hot sun and needing desperately to go back in the water, that Amos came down to the beach to see how much damage the hurricane had done. Of course, Boris and Amos recognized each other right away. I don't have to tell you how these old friends felt at the meeting again in this desperate situation, but Amos rushed towards Boris and Boris could only look over at Amos. Amos, help me, said the mountain of a whale to the moat of a mouse. 
I think I'll die if I don't get back in the water soon. Amos gazed at Boris in an agony of pity. It felt so bad for him. He realized he had to do something very fast and had to think very fast about what it was he had to do. And suddenly, he was gone. He ran away. Oh, I'm afraid he must not be able to help me, said Boris to himself. As much as he wants to do something, what can such a little fellow do for such a big me? Just as Amos once felt all alone in the middle of the ocean, Boris felt now lying alone on the shore. He felt very alone. He was sure he could die. He just wasn't prepared to. And as he was thinking about it, Amos came racing back with two of the biggest elephants he could find. Ta-da! He came to the rescue. Without wasting time, these two good-hearted elephants got to pushing with all their might. At Boris's huge body until he began turning over, threaded with sand and rolling toward the sea. Amos, standing on the head of one of the elephants, yelled instructions, but no one heard him. In a few minutes, Boris was already in the water with waves washing at him, and he was feeling the wonderful wetness. You have to be out of the sea to really know how good it is to be in the sea, he thought. That is, if you're a whale. Soon he was able to wiggle and wriggle deeper and deeper into the ocean. He looked back at Amos on the elephant's head. Tears were rolling down the great whale's cheeks. The tiny mouse had tears in his eyes too. Goodbye, dear friend, squeaked Amos. Goodbye, dear friend, rumbled Boris. And he disappeared in the waves and they knew they might never meet again, but they knew they would never forget each other. The end. Now, this book is really special to me because I feel like it's very important to be a good friend. And good friends are there for each other when they need each other. So, during this unique time that we have at home, think about something you could do for a friend. Maybe you could get their address and send them a little piece of art in the mail. You could illustrate your favorite part of the story at home and be a good friend to a family member and share that little art with them. Maybe you could help out around the house or maybe there's something you could ask your parents you could do and you can get permission to do something special for a friend, like write them a letter or send them a copy of your favorite book in the mail. It's up to you. How do you show friendship? I hope that you love this book and that you look up all the super cool William Steig books that are out there. He's one of my favorite authors. I miss you all and I hope to see you very, very soon. Bye.